So I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm so pleased and very grateful to welcome Kate Quinn, who is our second speaker this year. And Kate Quinn has been the executive director of the Muda Museum and Historical Medical Library and is the co-editor of What is a Museum? Perspectives from National and International Museum Leaders, published for the United States Committee of the International Council of Museums, so ICOM US, where she holds an executive seat on the board of directors and she also chairs the programming committee. Kate has previously served as the executive director of the James A. Missioner Art Museum. And prior to the Missioner, she spent 14 years at the University of Pennsylvania's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, starting as an intern and leaving as director of exhibitions and special programs. Before the Penn Museum, Kate also held positions at the Delaware Art Museum, the Philadelphia Horticultural Society, and Blinding Edge Productions, to name a few. And in addition to ICOM US, she serves on the boards of the Wharton Eshrick Museum and the Resource Center, Philadelphia's Creative Reuse Center. Kate is a regular guest lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, Drexel University, Seton Hall, and teaches at the University of Arts. So there's gonna be time for open Q&A at the end, but feel free to drop any questions in the chat or DM to ask. And with that, I will welcome Kate Quinn. So, so great to have you here. And we're going to be just having a general Q&A. So again, guys, if you feel like there's anything you want to ask, um, please feel free. Um, so Kate, something we always like to start off with, with everyone we meet, um, what made you want to go into the museum world? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, thank you so, so much for having me here. What a pleasure. I've been involved with the Museum Council since I was in grad school. So we're going back to 2005, I think is when I was first uh, introduced to the great organization that is the Museum Council. So I've been to many events and very excited to uh, now be able to share, hopefully, <laughs> some bits of my experience with, um, with everyone on the call today. Um, how did I get into the museum field? It's a very good question. Um, in a meandering way, I would say, like many of us, I think, do. Um, I was uh, studying theater. Uh, well, I started off as a studio art um, major in undergrad. I was a painter, um, and I was not terribly thrilled with my paintings, I would say. I wasn't getting anywhere with them. They were large-scale paintings, and I had some big ideas, but I, I'm not a good painter. I think that's kind of what it boils down to, but I tried my best. Um, but there was a call that was out in the... Um, gosh, I think it was in my dorm, that was asking for people who had skills in painting to come to the theater department. And they were going to give you the paint, they're going to give you the brushes, they're going to give you the canvas, and they're going to give you a story. And I thought, well, maybe this will break me of my, you know, my, um, my block really in, in painting. So I went and I painted a backdrop for My Fair Lady. And I fell in love with the theater <laughs> in that very moment. Um, I loved everything about it really first of all they were giving me all the supplies so that saved my budget which was something that I was really excited about but really you know the collaboration you know that it wasn't just on me to come up with these ideas and to think through them on my own there were so many people involved with this process there were designers there's a director there's a playwright in in their words that are left behind costume designers the actors themselves and um, I loved that dynamic and so I finished up my undergraduate degree with a focus on uh, design theatrical design. And when I left um, and I went to Indiana University of Pennsylvania, home of Jewish, Jimmy Stewart and, this, and the Christmas tree capital of the world. Um, for those of you who are looking, it's a great little five hour drive from here. It's a cute little town. Um, but I left IUP and I came back to Philly. Um, and from there, I think my first job, I worked in a bookstore <laughs> and um, on Penn's campus, actually, I was working at the Barnes and Noble. Um, but I was also then simultaneously working at the Philadelphia Opera Company. I was doing videography work. Um, and then I started to get into different firms uh, with painting. And so I was doing painting backdrops for the Walnut Street Theater. And uh, then I started to get into design work and I was designing for theaters up and down the coast. Um, and then I got into, uh, I designed for the Philadelphia Flower Show as an assistant to start. And then I did some more robust work with the Philadelphia Flower Show. And I, I will say that that was my first, the first time that I, I kind of was stopped in my tracks thinking about what I think the difference is between um, a museum experience, an exhibition experience, and a theatrical or a film experience. And to me, you're walking through the set. And that was really cool. It's like, oh, okay, the narrative's still here. And we're creating moments in what would have been something that was filmed for two minutes and then lives on screen. Now you get to walk through it. And I always loved walking through the sets because I got to do that as a designer or the painter. So that was my, my, my shift in thinking about um, exhibition design. I had been hired to design, no, this was before, right? So from there, oh, I was, I, I got, um, 
I painted some of the heart to the Franklin Institute. So I start to see how this works in museum field. And I was working as an art director in a company in Cherry Hill, New Jersey that focused mainly on marketing. And so I, I you know, I did a lot of marketing pitches and design work for, um, I designed the world's largest milk bone for milk bone and had dogs in Central Park eating this milk bone. I designed the world's largest bowl of baked beans that went into Times Square for um, Bush's baked beans when they used to have the dog eating the baked beans and talking. The world's largest margarita in New Orleans and things of that sort, world's largest and doing this kind of thing. And it was, it was interesting, but it wasn't really what I was excited about. Um, one of the things that they did that really was their bread and butter, as far as finances were concerned, is that we designed red carpet treatments for film premieres in New York City. Um, and so I had designed many red carpet treatments for like Brad Pitt to walk down for Troy and various others of the sort. But we had gotten the, and I've told this story several times, so I apologize if anyone has heard me say this before, but it is the thing that changed my, my, my career. And we got the job to design uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas with Jim Carrey. And I had designed many red carpet treatments. And so for this one, I chose Grinch Green as the carpet color. And uh, this is my, my boss at the time didn't believe in giving everyone computer access. So I hand rendered something like 20 different uh, approaches to what this step and repeat experience would be to get you into to get you passed and get Jim Carrey and the staff passed um, and into the theater. So I'm in this conference area and they had seen my renderings. I thought they did anyway, they did. And there, there was a conference call to talk about what I had presented. And I hear all these murmurings on the phone and they're saying, you know, Kate, she, Kate, is she there? And I was like, oh God, oh God, they hate it. They hate it, they hate it. So I was like, yes, I'm here, I'm here. And they're like, Kate, oh my gosh, we just saw your renderings. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And they say, um, you're brilliant. You chose the color green for How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And I was like, oh, I can't be brilliant for this. This can't be my moment in the world. Like this, this is not my moment. <laughs> so it was that very moment actually after that happened that I went back to my desk. They loved it. They went forward with it. We had that design. It was great. But I went back to my desk and um, started researching museum exhibition design and how do you get into museum exhibitions and how do you break into that? And through that, I found the museum studies program at the University of the Arts, which was right in my backyard. So I was amazed to see that. Um, I was always interested in grad school and gotten into some really prestigious programs for theatrical design. And I studied at Drexel for three weeks in interior design. It was not really at all what I needed it to be but this felt right. And so that's really what happened is that then I got into that program and I started there in 2005. And in the summer between my first and second year, I interned at the University of Pennsylvania um, and I never left. It was kind of what happened. I interned and then I volunteered and then I was part-time and then full-time and there goes 14 years of my life and, <laughs> and there it is. So that's how I got into it. So meandering is how I started. And I think I meandered through that description as well. I, I think that is so cool. Um, and so for everyone's reference, Kate and I met last year when I was studying museum studies as well and um, wanted to talk to her because she has so many varied experiences. So I learned something very new today as well. And I think it's good to also hear about the meandering experiences because sometimes we think you do a linear path where you go to school and you get this degree and then you get this job. But to know that you have so many different talents and that maybe painting didn't work out, but you found theater through that, it got to interact with a lot of cool celebrities and you know, you're in leadership roles you are now is something very inspiring. So um, you did mention a lot about how those background and experiences prepared you for the field. How much did you feel like you had to learn on the job when it came to, um, you know, either the theater productions or in, even in your museum work? I think we all learn on the job, right? That you're, you're getting as much as you can get from an education and it's mostly textbook, it's experience, but within a certain parameter, you learn the most when you're on a job. And so, you know, that's where in my time, they were unpaid internships. I wasn't paid when I was interning at Penn. I'm not advocating for it, but it's what happened, right? At the time and certainly in my, my experience, and I was able to do that. So there's privilege in what my experience is for sure. Um, but through that, I was able to understand how my skills could apply to what, a University of Pennsylvania experience would be. And I, I've been honest with this across the board. I, I did my internship at Penn and I some colleagues from Penn on the call tonight and I'm really glad to see your names there. Um, I was not excited about my internship at Penn. There were a lot of silos that were built up and people were not talking to each other. Mostly everyone was fighting with each other. And I was like, my gosh, if this is what museums are about, I'm not doing it. I'll go back to, I can freelance. I'll do some more work when it comes to design for theater or I'll go back to the flower show. I think they'll have me or I'll find something. I'll do something. 
Um, but I'm very stubborn. And so that was also something when they kept asking me to come back and that I, I was able to find a way to talk to the then um, director of exhibitions, who was uh, the head of exhibits, I guess, whatever it was, his title, he was the designer at the time. And his background was in hand rendering. And he had, um, he was a, a department store uh, window designer before he got to the Penn Museum. And he had been, when I arrived, I think he'd been at the Penn Museum 30 years, very long tenure. And so before that, he did what was the most popular thing at the time, which was design window treatments for department stores. So really amazing opportunities to have displays. And if you know anything about the history of, um, you know, display tactics and uh, provenience, a lot of museum collections were actually incorporated into not a lot, but enough. <laughs> Museum collections were incorporated into department store displays because there was an attraction there that seemed at the time to be ethical, seemed also at the time to be a way to gain attention for the museum displays, but also for the uh, the department stores. And so there was a lot of that. So he had that experience. And that was exactly what museum design was about at the time. People created windows of experience. So you would see this window, you got a glimpse into culture in a certain way. And that, that was just the trend. I have a theater background. So when I came into the role, I'm bringing a very different thing, but was also just the trend at the time. And I don't mean to di dismiss either of what I, you know, either one of us brought to the job at the time, but we were a product of our times in certain ways and a product of privilege, I think in both ways, um, but also able to come in at a time that, um, you know, we could make change. I told myself when I got to the Penn Museum, after my internship that, you know, when they were asking me to come back, I remember walking down the hall and those of you who know the Penn Museum was the Merle Smith Galleries, which is the way out of my office into the uh, group entrance area. And I was walking through it after I'd been offered the opportunity to become the director of exhibitions. And I knew the situation and I had had many people coming into my office to cry because they were frustrated with different things that were happening. And so I knew the situation, I knew the silos, I knew the issues, but I also knew what I thought could help change the institution. And so I said, you know what, to myself, I said, I will get, I'll give it six months. And if I can't um, see the support that I need to be able to move forward, if I can't make change, and if I'm not doing anything good or better than what it was before, I'll leave. I'll just go right on back to what I was doing. I had no issue there. So in many ways, I was just, um, I was free in that way. And I didn't have burdens on myself. I didn't place them there and I didn't take them from anyone as far as what I should be doing or, and I really did not at all because I was new to the field, recognize the prestige that was the University of Pennsylvania's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. And that was naivete, but also I think gave me some power in just doing things and taking chances that others maybe hadn't done or wouldn't do. Um, I, I probably could have and should have been fired many times for the things that I did, just taking risks and making new exhibitions happen. But I didn't, I didn't know any better. And the people who were in supportive of what we were doing thought it was so cool. And those who weren't were very much not in favor of it. So I started to navigate. So your question was about experience on the job. Absolutely. There's nothing like getting experience on the job. And um, I was invited back to the University of the Arts, I think about a year after I started at Penn officially in a director role. And they were doing a charrette and they were talking about what else could we do for our graduates? What more do you need to know to be better prepared to be in the roles that you're in? And I was in a class of my own. I think I was the only person who had risen to a director role that quickly. And it doesn't happen. It's not something that really happens to a lot of people and probably shouldn't have happened to me, but right place, right time kind of thing. I Privilege and luck. Um, but I was asking for more conflict resolution discussions. And my colleagues were saying, Kate, that's not what we want to have our students engage with. And I was like, but it's exactly what they need. Like, I've never experienced anything like the fighting I'm seeing here at Penn and that I have to figure out how to help this my job. I have to bring, we have to deliver a project. I'm a theater person. The show will go on. I just don't know how to get it there. I need help with this because these personalities and the difference of opinion and I'm not having the support I need from all of the folks to help me get, you know, those teams moving forward. Um, that's what I was asking for. So, you know, I, I guess that's a glimpse into what I was experiencing my first couple of years at Penn. Um, experience is worth so much and it's what you do with it, right? You have, you have whatever experience you're given. Every single one of us are different in what we've experienced from, from birth until the time that you're walking into a role, you get into the role, you're bringing what you have, and then you're experiencing what it is and the personalities who are at the table who are helping you or not helping you to move forward in what they're doing. You have to navigate. It's all human politics. That's really what all of our jobs are. 
but especially mine, my experience has always been just navigating humans and helping humans to, you know, be the best versions of themselves or to, you know, help me understand what it is they need and then figure out what to do to make that show go on. That's my theater background is we will open on time. That's just what we do. I yeah. absolutely love that. I, I think it's going to resonate with so many people. I'm just hearing like, you know, it is all human management. And I also work at Penn just in a different field. So I understand the kind of red tape and bureaucracy that can happen behind the scenes. But I love the idea of kind of window shopping and all these different kind of windows of experiences that you mentioned and to kind of go off that and dovetail into something else. You know, every exhibition and institutional goals are so different, Penn Museum, Mütter, you know, every other place that you've um, had experience in. So can you walk us a little bit through your planning process, like from start to finish and how you measure success as what makes a successful exhibition? Uh, exhibitions, I can handle exhibitions. Institutionally, there's, there's challenges there. Um, you know, I think, there's a science to what exhibitions are all about. And it's about educational foundations. And there's there's ways that you're creating informal learning opportunities. And there's ways to navigate through choices that could be made for making the best experience for those individuals based on science. So that's a foundation. And I believe in those foundations. I believe that design is interpretation. It's content in every way, because if it's not well designed, if there's not great lighting, if we're not telling you exactly where to look when you come in by all the cues, design cues that we can put in place, we're going to fail. People are going to fail. They're not going to see it. They're going to get frustrated. They don't know where the bathrooms are. If they don't know where the, the seating is, where can I put my stroller? All of those things have to be taken care of before you can bring folks in. So, you know, I would say that you have to have that foundation. And in my experience, a lot of times that isn't as clear cut. It wasn't clear cut at Penn. It wasn't clear cut at Delaware Art Museum when I was there, not at the Michener and not at the Motor. And it's, it's okay, right? It has to be built. And every institution is led by an individual who has a team typically of people around them. And the decisions that are made at the team are based on the personalities who are there and what they believe in. So there's no question that there's going to be different ways that every institution takes experience and takes what it is that is the foundation of what are good exhibitions and programs and everything that museums do. And it, and it shifts, right? It's going to shift in priority. It's going to shift in execution, depending on who's there and what you're dealing with. So with that in mind, you're going to come around to the idea of, you know, what makes a really great exhibition and how do you evaluate it? How do you make metrics for success? You know, I, I come from the theater film background, everything that I do as far as applying, it's a narrative structure, really, it's storytelling at its best form. And there's ways to do this, that you can create an arc with an exhibition, with a program, with an institution, right? You have an interpretive plan for an institution and what's the experience? You should be taken on a journey when you come into any of these institutions. And there are scientific ways to do that. And there are really creative ways to do it. And that's the fun of it all, is bringing this all together. Um, you should have metrics, but you can only have metrics to decide how, how well you did only if you establish them at the very beginning. So you always have to establish what the mission is or the big idea for your exhibition, what are your goals and objectives from there and hold true to them. And that's the early stages of exhibition development, I will say are always the hardest part. It's my most fun. <laughs> for me, it's the most fun. I will say not my most fun, but it's torturous for other people, I think, but it's just awesome because you're coming together with these big ideas and it's so cool to have everyone come together. And sometimes these teams are, you know, 20, 30 people and everyone's got a little bit of a different idea. You're on, on the same side with some things, but not everything. And so how do we make this thing together? Because it's about us moving together. I'm in my past jobs, I've been the person who has to make the final decision about it all and or coax my leaders into agreeing or disagreeing with what we're doing actually not disagreeing, you never want to coax anyone to disagree with you, but um, to get them on board with where we're headed. And, and you know, it's just so great to hear everyone's perspectives and then to know like, all right, the rest of the team's head in this direction, this, this person or these people are over here. What do we do about that? How do we move them forward? And how do you, how do you, you know, build momentum? So, I, you know, I think a lot of it is being clear and as, as best you can and saying, you know, hey, we're at this table, we're all doing this thing together. We're all gonna make decisions together. And we're not all going to be happy at any point. <laughs> there's, there's going to be people who are very upset. So there's going to be people who are really happy and it's going to fluctuate. This is going to be a two-year process. The point is that we're all heard, that we all know what our roles are and that we're all going to come together. And that when there's frustrations and when there's you know people who are upset, we're really, really happy, which is what I hope for. We'll work through it together and we're going to get there. But um, you know, it's a process. And in a lot of ways, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
therapy. <laughs> I think you're working through in some forms, but I also think that's the best kind of project, right? If you're that immersed and, and excited about it and that passionate about it, it means we're doing something. We're on the right track. We're all really excited and we really believe in this thing. It's just aligning it all so that we're doing the thing that suits the institution, the donors, which whole other, that's usually a lot of the consternation is about the donors and what they're, uh, how they're involved. But, um, but beyond that, you know, we're doing good for the community audiences. I always spoke with the audiences and who are our primary, secondary, and how do we serve them? What do they want? How do we do this? Um, that was long. I meander a lot. I apologize. No, that, that is amazing and fantastic. And then just knowing now, thinking back, like going to the Penn Museum, I know we have a lot of people who work at Penn and are also Penn alums who probably spend a lot of time in the Penn Museum. Um, and just thinking back when I did field trips in like high school and college, just like, oh, you're the one who was responsible for those exhibitions. And I can hear the enthusiasm in your voice for exhibition design and the projects that you've been working on. So, you know, being there for nearly 15 years, what were some of the exciting projects that you oversaw that you were particularly proud or fond of? I guess my most exciting one, I have to say without a doubt, <laughs> was the Secrets of the Silk Road exhibition because it was the first um, exhibition. We had built a new business model for the museum and that business model was all based on exhibitions and that it was going to be focused on the quote unquote blockbuster model, which we can say what we want to say about the blockbuster model, but it was one that we thought would be a way to, um, well, when I was hired officially, the director at the time uh, in our conversation, when he was asking me if I wanted to take on the role, he said, I, I really want you to turn the ship around. It's like, okay, what ship, what am I turning? Which, which boat am I on? And he said, you know, we have this amazing institution. The, it's unparalleled expertise. The collections are beyond, you know, compare, but we're really focused on telling stories about ourselves to people who are like us, researchers. You need to have a doctorate to understand what's on the walls here at the Penn Museum. So I want you to turn that ship around and turn it towards a general public audience. So let's make that something where, and that for me, really right time, right place. My theater background really helps with that. So I was you know, able to try a lot of models. And I think my first year on the job, officially, I inherited a stack of exhibitions that had already been approved. And there were 30. We did about 30 exhibitions in that first year, which is insane because there was a staff of three people and lots of objects, three-dimensional objects, which are just much more complicated to, uh, to design, to interpret, to install. Um, but I'm stubborn, as I said. And so I was like, yeah, well, we're gonna do it. We will do those 30 exhibits. Some were like smaller displays, but we had roaming cabinets that were going from, every lecture had a new exhibition. So we did like 12 of those. And then we had 2000 square foot shows. Anyway, so we had gone through that. And, you know, I just tried and true. I, I know I freaked a lot of people out because I painted different colors of the wall and people were like, hey, that's a pink wall. What are you doing? And I was like, well, all right. So when we open the show, if you remember that the wall was pink, I have failed. And we have to have conversations about that. You should not remember the color of the wall when you walk through. You'll, you'll feel something when you walk through, but it shouldn't be that the wall was pink. It should just be like, oh, that was lively or something along those lines. And so I started to talk to folks about what I was doing, what I was bringing to the table from a design perspective. Um, so I tested that. It was sometimes successful, sometimes not so successful, but you learn more from your failures than your successes a lot of the time. Um, so we had done that. And then we felt like we were ready to do this major shift in our um, in our business model. And that was to be like a very, you know, we were trying to compete with the Franklin Institute, which wasn't really a competition because we could never actually compete with the Franklin Institute the Penn, or the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They were just too big, but we wanted to head there. And I think that was noble. That's a good way to think about it. Let's try. Um, so we did this exhibition that was a partnership with several other institutions focused on um, people who had been mummified um, from China. So Xijing province and um, naturally mummified remains of a woman uh, and of a man and of a baby were the, the, the marquee objects. And we, I think we just did an amazing job with the design and the interpretation, which we reinterpreted from the institutions that had been prior. Um, it's still, you know, I love looking back at pictures and I wish there were more pictures that we had taken of it um, because it, it was just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful installation. The team was incredible and the passion behind it from the entire institution. Everyone was excited about this show and really wanting to move it forward. We had a little bit of a global kerfluffle when it came to actually being able to open on time that I think gained us more traction as an institution, but was shocking and terrible at the time that it happened. Um, we weren't able to actually open the crates and, and install the objects. And so um, we had to very last minute and very covertly um, create a new exhibition. <laughs> 
so we were very creative. The New York Times thought we were very creative in uh, in creating um, three dimensional, or sorry, well, we created a couple paper mache mummies, but we also did paper, like paper dolls, essentially of every object and put them in the cases um, to make it look as though this is what it's gonna be. And it was a beautiful show. And my, my claim to fame there was that when we did that, uh, the curator walked in and he's like, hey, you weren't supposed to put the objects up. What did you do? I was like, we didn't, Victor. Like, turn to the side. They're paper. It's all paper. It's all fake. Um, so for various reasons, that that is my, um, that will always be, it'll be very hard to beat that show in my heart and in my mind, because I think the entire team just did an incredible, incredible work. And I don't mean the exhibition team and the entire institution banded together around that. And just my team at the time, who, you know, both my, my, my um, peers at the executive level at Penn, but also my incredible team of exhibition and program people at Penn just did unbelievable things to make that happen. And it was, it was extraordinary. Absolutely. I am just getting the common thread that the show must go on. And I think that's just something, no matter what happens, it's just like you do what you can and it works out the way it's supposed to work out. So that is extremely exciting and um, pivoting a little bit. So, you know, on top of all the amazing experiences that you've had at different institutions, you've also had your own museum at planning and design business for over 20 years. So what inspired you to start your own business and be your own boss on top of all your other responsibilities? And what was that entrepreneurship process like? Um, so it's a little bit of a misnomer, I will say. Um, I have one client <laughs> with my business um, and uh, that client. So when I was starting out, after I finished um, undergrad, I worked in film and I worked on a lot of M. Night Shyamalan's uh, film sets. I painted fake wooden floors and I did backdrop paintings and made things look like marble, lots of faux finishes. And I met him once or twice, but nothing notable. Um, but we kind of kept in touch. I kept in touch with my peers through the years, but nothing, you know, nothing that I thought would actually lead anywhere, but this is the never burn bridges kind of conversation that we'll have here. Um, I was at the American Alliance of Museums conference in Los Angeles in 2010, and I got a call outside of LACMA. I'm staring at those gorgeous installation of the lamps outside of the institution. And I got a call from uh, M. Night Shyamalan's um, ex uh, assistant saying that they had just been to, he had been to the Penn Museum and his assistant had been there and fell in love with some of the displays at the Penn Museum and wanted the designer who did that or the person who made that happen to, to talk to and just have a consultation with. And I was like, well, this kid, where are you sure <laughs> I'm in LA right now? So what? Um, but they said, yeah, we want to talk to you. And I said, okay, great, sure. I'll be back next week and we can talk. And what was happening was that Knight's um, family, he was building a new, uh, a new, a new home um, out uh, in Newtown Square area, general area. And within the home, as you do, he was turning 40 years old and uh, he wanted to build himself a museum of his achievements within the within the, the compound of the new home. So I designed it. I designed his museum inside of his house and every year or two I go back and I update. And it's a lot of the film props and uh, stories about his experience and the script writing process, but it's a very select audience. It's not open to the public. Um, so he's my one client. <laughs> That's, I can do other things, but so I have it really just to maintain um, that clientele, but it's cool. It's, it's private and he uses it to cultivate other, you know, directors and actors and to help them to see what his process might be. And just, he just really loves museums. And so there's this cool factor about that. And his writing office is just above the museum and he comes down and finds inspiration when he, when he's writing. So it's a little bit of a misnomer, but that's why and how that okay, That's pretty incredible. <laughs> It's that's really amazing it's just happenstance really. wow um my uh, partner met him because he was filming the servant outside and m night Shyamalan yeah. was apparently a very lovely man so yeah. i it's love the philadelphia man. commitment that he has and uh, yeah he's very exciting a storyteller like no one i've seen and certainly when i talk to him he's well his favorite museum i now know he's like are you at the mooter like I am at the motor. He's like my favorite museum ever. And I was like, of course it is. Of course you love the that museum. Sounds just so like it. something together. And he's like, would you let me do something with you? I'm like, I, I'll consider it. And so <laughs> we're gonna hopefully we'll do something uh, moving forward. I was trying to get him invested in Penn. He loved Penn, but we couldn't figure out what the right thing would be. I mm -hmm. wanted him to curate a show, and he thought that was too much work, and he was right. But um, 
yeah, so we'll figure it out. But it's um, he, he's great, and to get inside that storyteller brain from what I you know grew up with when it comes to my my theater background and my my film background, that's kind of a, a common place for me as far as how we tell stories and what it's all about. So I I just appreciate the opportunity, and um, I'm just I'm just lucky in that way. That's all. <laughs> that sounds really amazing. So that. Also, I mean, we might have to have you back to talk about those experiences too. Um, and, you know, so you've talked a lot about kind of being, you know, an intern and then having all these different roles and the challenges that you've had, you know, with the exhibition design, planning, all the other things, human management. Um, so what other kinds of challenges, either personal or professional, have you otherwise overcome and learn from them? Because you did, you did say, you know, you learn more from failure than you did from success that you could share as advice with the rest of us. Yeah, I mean, um... I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And, um, you know, I think at so many points in my career and in managing people and in managing people being staff, but in, in colleagues, but certainly boards and donors and all of the people with whom are in the orbit that it means to be a director or uh, a VP, um, as I had been for such a long time in my career, you know, just, just mistakes, just misreading situations, just moving forward with what I think is right at the time, but not getting enough perspectives, not talking to enough people or like my, my gut is really strong. And I will say that I am learning to trust it and that I, I go against it. And there was something that came up actually recently where I knew when it was coming up, I was like, my gut saying like, don't, don't do it. It probably shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen. And I was like, no, 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 just let it go. It's fine. And it wasn't fine. And it was like, today I found out it wasn't fine. It's like, damn it. When will I learn to trust my gut? But um, someday I will. You know, you make mistakes, but you live, you try, you, you, you draw on your experiences. You do the best thing that you know at the time. I have made lots of mistakes. I have been someone who has suffered from, um, you know, pressures and not really knowing what to deal with it and let the pressures let me explode in ways that they shouldn't have. And those were learning opportunities. I, I do my damnedest to not have that happen again, but I'm, I'm vulnerable to it like everyone is. I'm still human. Um, so I guess those are the challenges. I mean, all of everything is human. It's people. I can't do anything on my own. No one can. No one should. And if they tell you they can, they're wrong. And so, you know, you have to think about the human experience. And a lot of the things I think about are, you know, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Why are you here? Why are you showing up at this place on this day, at this time, what drives you? And everyone has different drivers. Some are incredibly passionate about the institution. Some really just want a paycheck. Some have ulterior motives where they, they need the thing to be successful so they can do the thing that they want. None of those are invalid for the most part. Sometimes they are, but for the most part, people just have different ways of being and wanting and doing. And that's life. I mean, that's people. That's just what it's all about. The thing is, you need people. You need to understand people and you have to work with people to do the thing you want to do to make it better for other people. <laughs> so to serve audiences, we need to have teams. And those teams are people that have different experiences and different draws and drives and and, and to understand them and to know that. And I, I would love to say that I figured it out I haven't, and I probably won't. And I think there's some there's some pleasure in knowing I'll never figure it out because people should always change. And that means you should stay sharp all the time and talk to people and communicate with people and gosh, do your best to know that they can come to you and talk to you at any time. And I'm 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 trying with that. You know, I'm in a new role now. And so it's um, you know, starting to and trying to establish those boundary, not boundaries, but opportunities to come in. Um, this institution is a little bit different than all the others I've worked for. So I haven't figured out the best way to be available and to have that, but I'm trying. And, and, and when those of you who are from the motor on the call, hello, and please let's talk about that so we can be better. I can be better and we can be better together moving forward. Love that. It sounds like there's someone who's really open to feedback and welcome it a lot just to, because we all, we're all trying, we're all making mistakes, but it's good to have that positive reframe is what can we learn from this? Um, and, you know, Kate, when we first met last year, actually, when I was in asking you, um, you know, questions during my own museum studies program, you told me about your experience at the Museum Leadership Institute at Claremont Graduate University in California. Um, so what was that leadership program like and how did it help you in your leadership roles? It was awesome. It was the best. <laughs> um, so that's an in summary, um, but I'll tell you more about it so we don't just move on. Um, I was part of the class of uh, 2014, which is the first uh, renovated class. I guess they rethought the program and it relaunched in 2014. And um, I had been encouraged to apply for the program for a number of years prior to actually doing it. Every time I looked into it, I thought, mm, this looks like an MBA. It looks like business school. I don't 
want anything to do with that. Um, but I kept getting requests to consider it. <laughs> so I looked more deeply into it and thought, all right, well, I do need, I need help. Everybody needs help. And I, I would love to be stronger in what I'm doing. And if this is a program that others have gone through and I, I read about the people who had gone through it in the past, I was like, yeah, I respect these people. These are for the most part, there's a lot of really good people here. So I'll try. And I applied and um, I had, you have to have support from your director. Um, if you have one or your board chair, if you're already a director um, to move forward with the application. And uh, so I had to talk to my director about it. And he said, yes, you should absolutely do this. He had been encouraging me to do it prior to um, that conversation, but he made me promise him that if I got in, that I wouldn't leave. He said, most people who go through this program, they, they have a change in their, in their mindset and in their practice, and they leave their institutions on average within two years. Like, what? This is, that doesn't make sense. Um, but sure, I'll stay. Of course I'm going to stay. I'm, I don't know what this thing is that I'm doing. Um, so I got in and um, I said, all right, well, great. This is going to be cool, I guess. And I'll go to California for a few weeks and we'll have this conversation. It, it actually was very much life-changing in the ways that I, I, I didn't expect. It was a mini MBA is what it was um, over the course of about three to four weeks when you count the online programs. And you're just with a group of people who are going through the same experiences as, as you. They're museum people. There are the same types of collections that you're working with. And, you know, understanding how to be a better leader, how to manage people, how to think about human resources, um, how to think about strategy and, you know, execution and and audiences. And so I, I loved every minute of it. And I left there thinking, oh, I, I need my MBA now. Now I need to get an MBA which I didn't do, but I still toy with on a regular basis. It's a great program. I don't actually think that it's active now. I think they had some troubles with finances and um, they're, they're struggling and they're trying to find a way to re to bring the program back. They stopped it during the pandemic. So I, I have been talking to a few people, but um, it doesn't seem like they found a way forward yet. So I, I hope they do. And I'm happy to help them in any way possible because it's others should have the experience. It was really very good. That sounds really like a really incredible experience. And also California, that also just sounds like a really lovely time, you know, being, um, having a little mini vacation. Um, and, you know, Kate, you're also involved in so many other volunteer organizations. You're a peer reviewer for the National Endowment for the Humanities. You're on the board of directors for the for ICOM, um, you know, all these other things. Can you tell us about how you got involved? Oh gosh, with all of it. Um, so a lot of the peer reviewer uh, things, so NEH and NEA and, um, well, AIM, I'm a, I'm an accreditation person now. And so um, they've approached me about this through the years and I, I believe in giving back. And so I, I have not reached a point where I would say no to anyone about these things. And so that is uh, maybe my, uh, my fault, but I will continue to do that. The uh, International Council of, the Museum, of Museums and the, the other boards that I'm on, um, that was somewhat more strategic. And I will say with um, ICOM, uh, I was very interested in uh, international work uh, through my work at Penn. Um, and, you know, I wanted some other way to be involved with the larger museum community. And I was trying to get in, I guess, more um, firmly or more officially with, uh, with, uh, with AAM. I wanted to be more involved there somehow. But I kept hitting walls and that people were already maneuvering within the American system in ways that I, I just, I was getting frustrated and I wasn't excited about it anymore. But I had been going to ICOM's events when I was at the AAM conference and started to get excited about ICOM. And I knew about it, but I just didn't think that it would ever be possible for me to be involved. Uh, just given my status in 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 the career world, and then I was a VP, and didn't seem likely. But I started talking to them, and they said, "No, you're the, you're very much the kind of person we'd like for our board, so you should consider it." And I said, well, okay, cool. And so I had a really great conversation with um, with Lonnie Bunch, who's the secretary of the Smithsonian, and um, he's like, "Yeah, I'm going to be the chair, so you absolutely should think about that." And um, so I did, and then I applied, and. I was accepted into it and I've been active now with ICOM's board for since 2016 and I'm now on the executive committee and I uh, manage and chair co-chair the um, uh, program committee for ICOM US and it's it's remarkable it's a really amazing institution and it's global and you have these opportunities to understand better and to talk regularly to people around the world who are doing the same kinds of things that you're doing and dealing with the same kinds of issues that are coming your way and also dealing with very different things than you're dealing with and you know 
I teach internationally as well. And so teaching students in China and teaching students in Honduras and in Italy is very different than teaching students here in the United States. And the, per the perception of what it is and what, what they need to navigate through shifts and in those countries that are, are managed by government entities. They have a very, in, very strong interest in bureaucracy and how to work in a bureaucratic you know, system as opposed to, you know, my donors are terrible. All of it's legitimate. It's just different in how you have to find strategies to move forward. So um, I love ICOM US. I hope all of you will consider <laughs> or talk to me. Just reach out to me at any point. I'm happy to talk to you more about ICOM US um, and what it allows and, and provides. And it provides you an opportunity to understand and then to collaborate with colleagues around the world. And um, yeah, so it's, it's probably my, my fa I, I won't say favorite. It's a very, very strong of uh, the committees that I'm involved with and the boards I'm involved with. Well, they are very lucky to have you. That is pretty amazing to have, um, you know, to be involved with so many different things that are all committed to the museum field and advancing it. Um, and you mentioned all these amazing projects you're teaching, um, you know, your work, uh, your private work. So how do you balance it all and make time for yourself? Oh gosh. Um, I don't know. I guess, I guess I'm one of these folks that um, the idea of storytelling is my passion and that has been my passion regardless of whether or not I got paid for it. So a lot of times it just kind of falls into that. Not that I'm working 24 seven, but I think I'm thinking 24 seven. And a lot of it is about uh, stories that we're telling in different institutions or entities and what we could be doing better in museums. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm not answering your question except to say that it's just intertwined with who I am and it always has been. And maybe what it is is that I'm accepting it more. But what I'm also doing is making sure that I make time for myself in ways that I I think I hadn't done as 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 well in the past. I'm trying to not throw my back out every time I get stressed out, uh, which has been a trend lately. So or in the past, um, the beach. I love to just stand in front of the ocean and breathe and look at how tiny I am. And and I think that's a really important thing to do is to know that you're you're tiny. You may think you're big in the world or that you've got a big problem, but everything about you and your experience it is what it is. But it's one of many. And, and to look at that ocean and to know that it's, it's, you have a limited amount of time on this planet and a limited amount of time where your body is gonna function in the way that you want it to function. So appreciate it and to do the best that you possibly can with the time that you're given. And uh, you know, I've, had, um, I've had reason to, to look into that and to think about that and um, I appreciate it a lot more, so. Absolutely, it's definitely a humbling experience when you realize just like how big and beautiful the world is. Um, and I want to leave some time for questions at the end because I know some of them are coming. So a couple more left, you know, what, um, you know, any tips for those who want to rise in the museum field? We do have some people who are starting off, some people who are more mid to professional in their careers. Um, so what advice would you kind of give to anyone who, whatever stage they are, and especially those interested in exhibition design? Yeah, you know, it's, it's so exciting. I'm very jealous of younger people <laughs> and being able to, you know, be where I was, you know, I, I miss that the world is wide open and what do I want to do with my life? And I can do anything, you know, you start to get to a point where I am, where it's like, oh, okay. I think maybe I have like four jobs left before I have to retire. And whoa, what do I want those jobs to be? And it, there's pressure in ways that maybe I'm applying to myself, but I, I'm a very strategic person. So that's what I think about. But going back to when I was, you know, 18, 21, when I was just finishing my undergrad and, and even before, right, just what, what does the world offer? It's such an amazing time. So what I will say to folks who are, um, you know, just out of undergrad and trying to figure it out, um, I'll say it to everyone, I guess, is, is to, to try the best that you can to know yourself. Because understanding who you are, what you're able to do, what your limits are, what your tolerances are, which is probably the biggest part of all of this, will help you to understand maybe where you're best suited to be in the world. And, you know, do you want to be a leader? Do you think in, in the depths of your gut, you want to run a museum someday? <laughs> All right, then what, what you should do, what I did, take a look at who has run museums that you admire. Who's that person? Who is the person before them? Looked on LinkedIn. What do they do to get there? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to spend the rest of your time getting a PhD to get into, you know, other programs to be able to do this to eventually get to that point? It'll just tell you what has happened to other people to get to where it is that you want to be. It helps you understand yourself, right? And it doesn't mean it's a map for you. It just means it's what other people did to get where they are. So LinkedIn is your friend. Google's your friend, of course. But start thinking, that's the person I want to be. I want to I do that, I think. 
figure it out. Just look. Um, if you know, then you want to head in this direction. If you want to do exhibitions, you want to be an exhibition designer um, and look to see, you know, okay, this person is an exhibition designer or leading an exhibition department at a certain institution, and they have a degree in illustration and a degree in archaeology. I'm not saying that you need to do that, but you need to understand what it was that attracted the, the, the hiring committee to that application. This was the experience. Talk to them. People always want to share what it is that they have done. Look at me. I'm talking all about myself tonight. I'm happy to do it. I hope that it helps people. But everyone would love to talk about themselves for the most part, almost without exception, especially one-on-one -on -one conversations and you have direct you know, questions to ask. Talk to people. Talk to people. Just to pick up the phone, write an email to say, hey, I think your career is pretty awesome and I'm interested in it. Would you mind talking to me? almost every time they're gonna say yes. They have very little reason to say no. They wanna help the future of this field as well. So I think, you know, finding people that you admire and asking, taking them to coffee or just having a Zoom call. It's so easy now, it's so easy. I took so many people to coffee, but you could just have a Zoom call now. It's really easy to do. Um, that's, that's my recommendation. I love that. And that I think that's great advice for you. In fact, that's how I found you last year. And you actually took the time to respond. And now we're here. So thank you so much for that, because not everyone was as open or welcoming as you. So it's great that there are people who, like you, are committed to advancing people's careers and just um, giving more information. And so I want to leave the rest of the time for some Q&A. And I know some people have put some things in the chat already. Um, sure. So if anyone else has anything they're thinking of, um, please feel free. So someone's asking, what drew you to the Mütter Museum? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, I grew up in Philly. I'm a Delco girl. Um, so I went to the Mütter Museum first when I was, uh, I think, 15. Um, and I was um, mortified by what I saw. I was so overwhelming. And I was there with my best friend at the time um, who knew about it. I had not heard about it. Um, and I, I remember like standing in front of these specimens and just like, what is this? It's amazing. And it's terrifying. And it's awesome. And I can't wait to come back. I have to bring people. Um, so it's been on my radar as an institution that I admire um, and are, I'm really interested in for an incredibly long time since I was 15. And I'm not 15 anymore, but it's been a few decades. Um, so that was, I guess, the first part of it is that there's this, um, well, you know, if you grew up in this area, you grew up in Philly, you know, the Mütter, you have pride in the Mütter, at least in the past, you know, 30, 35 years. Prior to that, it didn't seem to have as much popularity, but but people knew about it. So that that was there, right? That was a thing. I knew about it. I, I was interested in it. Um, spending as much time as I did at the Penn Museum, certainly we had a lot of um, uh, a lot of experience with human remains. And I, I had a lot of experience with human remains myself in leading different programs or exhibitions. Um, so it wasn't anything that I that was foreign to me as far as um, ethics and and proper proper parameters in which you're dealing with human remains and certainly lots of questions about that altogether. Um, so I had a foundation in it and I'd left the Penn Museum to go to the, the Michener Art Museum in Doylestown, which, you know, those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a regional art museum. An art museum was a little bit of a stretch, I guess, for me at the time, that's what I felt was that was the stretch. Um, but a lot of colleagues who were like, oh, that, that seems like that's the right thing to do, but why the mooder? Like, that seems like a jump. But to me, the motor is exactly where I was supposed to be headed, I guess, after uh, the Penn Museum. That's where a lot of my experience lie. Um, when I was at the Penn Museum, which was the bulk of my career, um, I loved the collections. I loved the potential of storytelling, which to me was limitless. We're going to tell the story of what it means to be human. And oh my gosh, like that, there's everything in the collections there and the expertise there. You could you could go in any direction. There's no 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 loss of opportunity for storytelling there, except um, that we didn't have specimens in the way that the motor does, and and we couldn't tell the scientific story. That wasn't really our mission. We couldn't tell the health benefits or any of that. So a lot of it for me is oh, this is the second part of what I was doing at Penn. We're telling the story of what it means to be human, but now we can tell it from a biological standpoint and we can actually look at your body and we can talk to you and show you what happens when cancer invades your body. And we can help you through programming, understand what to do, how to do it, where you find support systems, how to manage and lift and work through the insurance industry. There's so many opportunities for, for direct help to what society needs on a very, very personal level that, um, that I'm really excited about, that I think that that's um, 
super, super amazing. Um, also, the, the Mütter has a strong um, aspect of its mission that's about public health. And um, I'm eager to get started in helping the public health initiatives. Let's talk about gun violence. Let's talk about opioids. Let's talk about homelessness and poverty and addiction and all of these things um, that we can show you that through our collections that we can talk about through the expertise that is the fellowship that we can do with with the institution that we have. And uh, so I'm really eager to work with the teams there to figure out what, you know, what's, what's the right fit. And if we're headed in that direction, how do we do it to the best way possible? And so that that to me is, I think the opportunity there is, there's nothing like the Mooters collections and there's nothing like the opportunity that they present and there's nothing like the future and what awaits and what future audiences will need or want um, from what we can give. So that's long, long, short answer <laughs> for why. No, that, that's amazing. That's and I think that's also just really exciting to hear about, to look forward to under your leadership, what um, these kinds of important topics are and how they're gonna be addressed in the future. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has any other questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat or come off uh, mute or camera if you'd like to. Um, but Kate, you did mention a little bit before, you know, we would love to learn a little bit more about you. Where can we find um, ways to connect with you or contact you? Oh, fun. Um, <laughs> well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I'm on all of these places, but I'm happy. I, my email address, I think, is on the Motors website. And, you know, really, however you can find me, find me. I'm happy to talk almost to anyone at any time. So um, it shouldn't be too difficult, but if you want, <laughs> you have my contact information. So if folks reach out. Absolutely, out, absolutely. Ready and I'm happy um, to do that. Perfect. So I guess what the last question is, you know, with the opportunities arising for museums post COVID and then again, in your new role at the Mütter and the um, the things that you were talking about, what are some things that you're looking forward to just in the, in the general field, museum exactly. studies in the museum world? Gosh, it's exciting. Um, well, I'm really excited about what, we've learned from COVID and what, what it means to be, you know, I guess more humane altogether when it comes to thinking about people and, um, you know, hybrid work environments and the idea of, you know, flex time. And can we take a moment to look at how people work best and where they work best and how can we move forward in a way that allows people to, you know, spend more time and be more, you know, around their family and friends while still doing the work that they're doing. You know, it gets back to, you know, certainly my understanding and my belief that, you know, you have to understand people and what drives them to come to the institution every day. And if, and, and the policy part is hard, right? You've got all of these policies that are uh, human remains, or human remains, human resources policies that drive institutions and are based on legal standings and all of that is real. And that, that drives institutions and there's reasons why they're there. Sure, but there are also ways I think to, uh, to to you know talk to people, think about what it is that we can do to change that's within those parameters that help help everyone to feel fulfilled in a way that you know if, if you feel good about what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it, and there's clarity in your role, there's clarity in the mission, there's clarity in the direction, you can decide you know this is this is a place I want to be or this is not the place for me, but I'm going to find the place that does the thing for me. So how can we all help everyone to be where it is they're best suited to be and hop around, like figure it out. I've, I've had a couple of jobs myself, many jobs. I, before I was in um, museums, I was in theater. I always had two jobs because I couldn't get health insurance or I didn't have stability in a certain job. So I was always jumping around and hopping around. And, you know, I learned so much more about myself in that way. Another thing that I will always recommend to people, interview everywhere all the time and it sounds like it's something where like oh i don't want to interview another no 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 every time you're you're interested in a position apply for it get the interview because you learn more about yourself in that interview process than they're going to learn about you it doesn't mean you're going to take it or that you have to move forward but it means that you're going to have to answer questions about yourself for this role and you're going to have to answer questions they're asking of you and for me every time i had to answer questions i was like oh I, I don't, I really don't think I want to, I don't want to oversee fish. I don't want living collections. I don't think that's really, that's not me right now, but I didn't know it until you asked me the question and I had to think about it. So I'm always interested in having folks, you know, just interview. It doesn't hurt anything. It doesn't mean you're moving on. It doesn't mean you have to stay or take the role, but just do it. It's healthy, I think for, for the organization, because also they're going to learn more about what they want and what it is that they're looking for by the answers you're giving. And um, you'll certainly learn more about yourself. 
Here, here. Oh my gosh. I wish I could just like underline everything that you mentioned. And as a plug, as on our museum council, we have a job board with postings every first and 15th of the month. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, then you can definitely practice those skills and see what else might be out there um, so that you can learn more about yourself as well. But okay, thank you so much for coming here tonight, for sharing your wisdom, for sharing your time, for all the amazing experiences and just everything that you've given to us. And congratulations on your five month anniversary tomorrow. Um, and we are really excited to see you know, what you're going to do with um, you know, transform the mooder for the better. It's, it's already amazing, but how you're going to continue with it. Um, and so we do have many more events coming soon, including a member meetup on the 28th and a behind the scenes tour with the Museum of the American Revolution. Um, so details are online on our website and sign up for our newsletter. Keep in touch with our socials like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all the rest for that most up-to-date information. And we would love to see you soon. Thank you guys so much. Thanks and so thank much you for again. having me.